Tonight, it's without doubt the greatest corporate catastrophe and cover-up in aviation history. A catastrophe that saw two planes crash, killing 346 people. It went straight into the ground with its nose. It then exploded. And a cover-up that almost brought the world's biggest aircraft manufacturer to its knees. Our commitment to safety is unwavering, and we do regret the impact that this has had to passengers. The company was Boeing. The aircraft it built was the 737 MAX. Tonight, we'll recreate those terrible crashes. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Wow. And I'm going to try and pull back out of that. Take you into the cockpit of a plane that was designed with a fatal flaw. A disaster aircraft with a deadly secret that Boeing knew about all along. It was a ill-designed and rushed engineering plan to get an airplane out swiftly. Now, despite everything, it has been cleared to fly again, and it's coming to Australia. Until all the facts are out and they quit hiding the fact, I wouldn't recommend anybody get on that airplane. Tonight, we ask, should Boeing be trusted with our lives again when so many have already been lost? Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining me tonight, Trevor Jensen, the former technical director of the Australian International Pilots Association. He's been part of Qantas's flight operations team and he's flown almost every Boeing passenger plane since the 1960s. They avoided the true safety issues here for cost. It's just wrong. Ben Groundwater, veteran travel writer, he speaks for the flying public. How is Boeing not saying there's a system on board which could possibly have been involved in this crash and this is what to do in, in case it, it uh, malfunctions? Byron Bailey, aviation expert and a former RAAF fighter pilot. There was no pilot error. They just didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. And Peter Morisecki, an aircraft engineer who believes Boeing has been harshly treated over the 737 MAX. I think they meant well. Boeing considered that the event would be so unusual. On October 28, 2018, Lion Air Flight 610, a Boeing 737 MAX, just two months old, was cleared for takeoff from Jakarta Airport. The flight lasted only 12 minutes and was horrifying for all on board. Without warning, an automatic control system called MCAS activated, taking over the plane and forcing it into a steep dive. The pilot and first officer desperately tried to regain control, but they were completely unaware the MCAS system existed, let alone how to fight it. Line Air 610 hit the water at high speed, killing all 189 people on board. Family and friends of those on board appeared helpless and inconsolable. This was the first hint something was because wrong because it was a brand new aircraft. Yes, and I think it was hidden by the fact that it was Lion Air and we, do you, do you we think moved away. Boeing should have got involved at that point Absolutely. and owned up to what had gone wrong? Well, I think that this was the first point where they could have started to speak up, but they weren't going to. And the fact that it happened on Lion Air masked what a problem was. Byron, when you saw that crash, did you think something's wrong or did you think third world problem? <laughs> third world problem. And the fact it was a brand new plane didn't make you think, gosh, it's something's... No. That's not good? 95% uh, of all crashes have some pilot involvement. Then the public, when they saw that crash, probably just said note to self. I think the flying public definitely thought to themselves, not flying Lion Air, going to be careful in Indonesia. I don't think there's any thought that maybe Boeing is at fault here and, and you should avoid Boeing planes. Peter, did you think to yourself that first crash this is an airline issue, a pilot yes, issue. Yes, I did, definitely. Okay. You might wonder why Boeing had to put an automatic control system in the plane at all. 
The answer is it had to, because at its heart, the 737 is a 54-year-old aircraft. Since it first flew in 1967, over 10,000 have been made. Boeing's cash cow, with its design remaining essentially the same. But in 2010, Boeing's biggest competitor, Airbus, was about to steal its customers with a newly developed fuel-efficient passenger plane. Boeing had no choice but to come up with its own version. But instead of building a new aircraft, Boeing decided to redesign an old one. It added larger, more fuel-efficient engines to its warhorse, the 737, and called it the Manx. This Boeing is 54 years old. So it's been stretched, they put new engines on it, they've moved the engines forward. There comes a time where I think somebody has got to sit back to suddenly say, hang on, stop. Hang on, hang on, that's a misnomer of 54 years old. This aeroplane is built from new materials, new technology materials, new design systems. Yeah. It's basically looking the same, but it ain't the same. Yes, but Peter, that's the that's, problem. That's, that's, your, that's, that's your the your problem accident. I'm making, that because it looks the same, nobody has actually gone back and challenged that. But Boeing hit a problem redesigning the 737. The Max's new bigger engines couldn't quite fit beneath its wings and had to be moved forward. That caused a lift effect that tended to force the plane's nose up, potentially risking a stall. And stalling can literally make an aircraft fall from the sky. So Boeing came up with MCAS, which stands for Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System a software program designed to counter that instability, which, when activated, would force the plane's nose down to stop it from stalling. As I understand it, this is an aircraft that required the engines to be moved forward because mm -hmm. they were hitting the ground, basically. Right. Yeah. So as a result, it did change the aerodynamic factors. Yeah. And therefore, yes. this MCAS system had to be employed. But incredibly, Boeing did not tell airlines or pilots that the MCAS system had been built into the MAX. And why? Because of money. Boeing had promised airlines that they would not need to spend millions retraining pilots to fly the MAX. And in its belief, MCAS would automatically deal with the aircraft's potential to stall. In Boeing's view, pilots didn't need to know of this software program that could literally take control of the plane. Now, the MCAS was the secret. It was kept secret. It wasn't. I, I, I it don't was. Agree it was with never. That. Pilots were pilot, never told. Did the pilots know? They just never if, talked if, about if, it. If the, oh, hang on. No, no, no. There's a big difference. If they would have known, if this would have been brought forward, what's the big? We would have trained. Why didn't they do it? Because airlines didn't want to put the people in the simulator and do exactly. some of the basics. It's so, cost. There is a huge amount of pressure from Boeing and from outside influencers yep. to get this engine onto this plane. And so the engineers making that change and putting MCAS in is a symptom of all of that happening beforehand. It's not that, just engineers being That's seen. where it all began. It all began about how can we make money. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Instead of talking to pilots and how can we fix this, engineers thought, ah, we can sneak in a little system. Pilots don't need to know about it. It'll handle this little business where pilots are not going to be flying anyway. You're being so, a bit so cynical, Byron, because I think that MCAS was designed and put in for good reason. I think they meant well. I don't think it was supposed to be a cynical exercise to fool the pilots. No, not cynical. They just thought they, they thought pilots didn't need to know. Well, if anything affects the flight controls, pilots must know. And if pilots didn't know, passengers certainly had no idea the plane they were boarding could kill them. I'm very angry. I don't think I'll ever f be able to forgive what happened. Coming up, inside the cockpit on the Max's death dive. Pilot's manuals, there's no mention anywhere of MCAS. That time, we just got completely away from it. Boeing was hiding that information just to keep the plane certified and in the sky. That's next on Under Investigation. 
The world's most trusted aircraft company tries to upgrade its oldest plane, the 737. What it comes up with is the MAX, whose new, larger, fuel-efficient engines make it vulnerable to stalling. Boeing's solution is a flight control system called MCAS, which automatically pushes the nose of the aircraft down to avoid stalling. But it's a software program pilots are not told about. When the MCAS system incorrectly activates on Indonesian line Air Flight 610 in October 2018, the 737 MAX plunges into the ocean, killing all on board. Family and friends of those on board appeared helpless and inconsolable. Approaching with a rotate speed. In a simulator, veteran 737 pilot Chris Brady explains what the pilots of the line air flight had to deal with before they crashed. Gear up. 32 seconds into the flight, an alarm warns that the plane is flying at an unusually steep angle. What its pilots don't know is that it's a faulty reading from a damaged sensor called an angle of attack sensor. It triggers the MCAS flight control system, pushing the nose down violently. Now the flaps have retracted. This is the point at which the MCAS would, uh, would come alive. I'm gonna have to use trim to help me out of it. So you can see how happening. dramatic that was. That's happening irrespective of anything you're trying to do. That, that's, yes. That's just happened whether you liked it or not. Yes. The Lion Air pilots had no idea MCAS even existed. The faulty sensor still wrongly indicates the aircraft is pitching up. So five seconds later, MCAS takes over again. So I now think the problem's gone. I think the problem's solved. But what we don't know is behind the scenes, in the black boxes, they're counting to five, and as soon as they count to reach five... It happens again. Back down we go again. Into misbehaving. And you look out the window and, oh my God, you, you're in the dive again. It's logic is programmed 10 seconds on, five seconds off. And we don't know that because we as the, we as the pilots have never been told. It was never in our manuals. Again and again, Chris Brady fights the rogue MCAS system that keeps pushing the aircraft into a dive, but it's a losing battle. It will start to trim down, so let's go in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you can see that we're now in a very, very steep dive. I'm not a pilot, but that makes me almost sick to think about. I mean, me too. Me too. It's such a horrible situation to be in, it's unimaginable. One of the terrible things about that is if you didn't know about this MCAS system, you're on a steep decline to hell. Well put. I mean, the pilot's manuals, the training manuals, everything, there's no mention anywhere of MCAS. What we do know is that Boeing's own test pilots had discovered this issue right. and in the simulator had pointed out that he was not able to recover and he described it as catastrophic. It was 2016 when one of Boeing's test pilots had warned the company of the potentially catastrophic consequences of the MCAS system taking over the aircraft. It's running rampant in the sim on me. One pilot referencing the flight simulator. The plane is trimming itself like crazy. Now that is information, isn't it, Peter, that it was passed on to Boeing on six separate occasions and Boeing didn't pass that information on. What does that tell us? Well, that tells me is that Boeing considered that the event would be so unusual, so exceptional, that even if you trained up for this, people would quickly forget the fact that it was there because there's a lot of systems on aircraft that you don't get trained on. If a test pilot came in to me and said, this is catastrophic, I'd go, bloody hell. 
It seems incredibly forgiving to me, to, to Boeing, to say that the reason that they didn't flag this catastrophic issue was because they thought it was such a, a rare event and, and such a small chance. Maybe that did play into their thinking, but that seems very forgiving to me, given the external pressures that were involved, given they needed to get this plane into action, into service, given they wanted to save money. There's a lot of possible reasons why they would have held back from doing something about what they thought was a very small chance of something going wrong. It's just wrong. They avoided the true safety issues here for cost because it was going to cost about $10 billion, I understand, to do a proper certification. As would later be revealed, behind the scenes at Boeing, the company knew that MCAS was almost certainly to blame for the Lion Air crash, but its public statements made no mention of it. Our commitment to safety is unwavering, and we do regret the impact that this has had to passengers. Speed breakup. At 8.38 a.m. on March 10th, 2019, less than five months after the Lion Air crash, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 takes off from Addis Ababa. It's considered one of the world's safest airlines. But shortly after takeoff, Ethiopian Flight 302 is suddenly out of control. This time, the critical angle of attack sensor has broken off. Alarms falsely indicate the plane is climbing steeply. Just as with Lion Air, MCAS literally takes over the controls, pushing the plane into a steep dive. That Ethiopian aircraft was also a brand new Boeing 737 MAX, in fact, just four months old. The crash site strewn with personal effects, eyewitnesses gave their version of the final seconds. It went straight into the ground with its nose, it then exploded. It hit the ground at an estimated speed of 1,100 kilometres an hour, killing all 157 passengers and crew. Two of them were the only sons of Ike and Susan Riffle. The last thing on my mind was an air accident. The pain is unimaginable. Ike and Susan's boys, Melvin and Bennett, were on the adventure of a lifetime. They were soon to return home to Reading in California because Melvin's wife, Brittany, was about to give birth to their daughter, whom they'd already named Emma. When you realise that after the first crash, there was a recognition of a problem, but it wasn't dealt with properly, how did you react to that? It's hard to even think about it. Yeah. It's hard to even think that in this world, in this day and age, that anyone, a company, a person, anyone, would just continue on as if nothing had happened. It's just, I can't comprehend that. I can't see how that's possible. Because the truth is, if it had been addressed after one crash, the second crash should never have occurred. Correct. Exactly. Correct. And it's all, and, and like I say, it's just almost surreal that Boeing was hiding the information that they knew. I think they knew what happened on the first crash and they were hiding that information just to keep the plane certified and in the sky. For Ike and Susan, it has been two years of terrible revelations about a company they trusted with their only children. A company that already knew, even before they boarded their Ethiopian flight, that the 737 MAX was flawed. As parents who have lost your children, your sons, that's unforgivable, isn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's very unforgivable. 346 other people lost their lives in that thing. Our two boys, you know, had a zest for life. They loved life and they trusted Boeing and the 344 other people on those planes trusted Boeing to build a product that wasn't unsafe. And uh, I guess that's a mistake they made. <laughs> if Boeing putting a flight control system into the MAX that pilots knew nothing about wasn't bad enough, the company made the MCAS system capable of being triggered by just one angle of attack sensor. Virtually every aircraft safety system relies on at least two sensors for reliable information in the event one is damaged or destroyed, as happened in both the Lion Air and Ethiopian crashes. 
Well, I've never flown a, a civilian jet that doesn't have two angle of attack sensors and yeah. vanes and whatever. Tell me what's happening in the passenger seats. What are they experiencing? This has been pushed down to nearly 40 degrees nose down. Now that is the kind of stuff, as a fighter pilot, you're doing strafing attacks, aren't you? Or, or dive bombing. Dive bombing. Yeah, dive bombing. Yeah. These are passenger aircraft, not fighter aircraft. That's so it, 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 it must be absolutely frightening. horrific. Yep, frightening. In the cabin, anything that's loose is going to be tumbling and coming forward. For pilots, they're at the forefront. They can see the you ground see coming. The you know, while you're trying to save uh, them, you're trying to save you too. Yeah, you're trying to well, fly the airplane. You're trying to fly the airplane. Your mind's going to be totally on that. Yeah. And at this point, as uh, holding the weight of that aircraft, trying to pull it back, physically, you can't. You're actually totally occupied physically. After two crashes in less than five months, at least to Boeing's customers, there was something terribly wrong with the 737 MAX. Two days after the Ethiopian crash, airlines around the world grounded the plane. It's caused chaos at some American airports and mixed feelings from travellers. I think it's the right choice. We wondered when we got on the plane why we were still flying on it. In perhaps a sign of the revelations to come, the US took another 24 hours to make that decision, becoming the last country to ground the MAX. We just got a call from your company. You need to contact them. The tower south of 410, we've been directed to return to the gate. Boeing said it supports this proactive step out of an abundance of caution. America's aviation watchdog, the FAA, would later be severely criticised for holding off grounding the MAX for so long. This was a blow for Boeing. Having to accept something was wrong was resisted. You have to agree with that. Definitely. This is not true safety, it's national pride. You've got a, a terrific Airbus product out there. You don't need your 737 grounded globally. And when the rest of the world moved, I think that's when the FAA was forced into it. But there was certainly, I believe, the FAA would have held off a long time and would not have grounded if the rest of the world hadn't grounded. I think they, that was the crunch point. Ben, when the 737 MAX was grounded around the world, did the public take notice then? Did somebody go, they did, certainly, and, and I think there is, there's a measure of, a, a large measure of trust that the public has in regulatory authorities, particularly in Australia, in the US, in, in Europe, countries that we're comfortable with and that we know well. And so when those, when those bodies took that action to ground the planes, I think that's when the general public thought, okay, that is where the problem lies. But despite the immediate grounding of the 737 MAX and an investigation of its MCAS system, Boeing allowed speculation pointing to pilot error to continue. Pilots around the world were furious, including America's Allied Pilots Association's Dennis Tager. It was clear to us soon after the uh, two crashes that Boeing was going to an old playbook. Then they started to chip away at the skills of the pilots. For something that we've seen frequently after any aircraft crash. So we were contemptuous of that attempt and we had to keep coming back to, no, it wasn't the pilots that caused this. It was a ill-designed and rushed engineering plan to get an airplane out swiftly. And all the evidence points to all of our darkest suspicions. Coming up, uncovering Boeing's shocking secrets. If you have a production problem out of a factory, you've got to shut the line down. It's corporate homicide. Yeah. Want to now welcome our witnesses. And, and the most famous pilot in the world, Captain uh, Sully Sullenberger, weighs in. These crashes are demonstrable evidence that our current system of aircraft design and certification has failed us. That's next on Under Investigation. Tower South of 410, we've been directed to return to the gate. Boeing's star aircraft, the 737 MAX, is grounded worldwide after two catastrophic crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia. Our two boys and the 344 other people on those planes trusted Boeing. Guess that's a mistake they made. Both aircraft taken over by a flawed flight control system called MCAS. When you look out the window, you're in the dive again. Kept secret from the pilots until the terrifying end. 
It went straight into the ground with its nose. It then exploded. The aviation world was now on full alert that Boeing knew about the potential fatal flaw in its aircraft all along. Its CEO, Dennis Muhlenberg, faced fierce public scrutiny. All right, thank you. There are a lot of passengers who are afraid of the MAX. Have you considered resigning? The public, and particularly pilots, were incredulous that their safety could be so shockingly compromised. It was a frustration voiced by Captain Sully Sullenberger, the heroic airline pilot who landed a passenger jet on the Hudson River. These crashes are demonstrable evidence that our current system of aircraft design and certification has failed us. Captain Sullenberger was speaking to the US Congressional Inquiry set up to investigate what was swiftly becoming one of the darkest corporate cover-ups in American history. These accidents should never have happened. We should design aircraft for them to fly that do not have inadvertent traps set for them. I guess Sully speaks for every pilot, ultimately, and that's a big thing for him to have put his face up to make these statements. Do you agree? I agree, yeah. yeah. His statements were spot on. This is pub test stuff. You know, you, you design a system, you put it out there, you don't tell people, you have an accident, you still keep it quiet to uh, put a product out. Perhaps one of its most disturbing revelations was that Boeing had originally placed an MCAS warning light in the cockpit and information about the system in the MAX's training manual. Unforgivably, both of these were removed in the final versions of the 737 MAX, leaving its pilots completely in the dark. I have seen very early versions of the manual that indicate that you had uh, MCAS in the manual, your test pilot asked FAA to take it out, and it came out. Chair DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, members of the committee. But there were more damning revelations to come. Whistleblower Ed Pearson, a senior engineer at Boeing, was so disturbed by what he saw as a shocking drop in safety standards in the rush to manufacture the thousands of Maxes on order, he repeatedly wrote to executives, urging them to shut the factory down. I requested a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the general manager on July 18th and repeated my recommendation to shut down the factory for a brief period of time. When I mentioned that I've seen operations in the military shut down for lesser safety concerns. I will never forget his response, which was, the military isn't a profit-making organization. Now, Ed Pearson wrote to all the board members, and that included the current CEO, and he never got a reply. Boeing was determined not to let anything step in the way. Am I fair in saying that? Yes, you are. If you have a production problem out of a factory, you've got to shut the line down. But you start to have people like these coming forward, you've got to listen to this, people you've got to listen to. He did take it, he finally got one meeting with a senior manager and he described that meeting as tense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because he was saying, this is unsafe and this is the 737 MAX and that's before any crash. That's right. And th this is just a complete change of the culture that we've known in Boeing. And they're driven now commercially. Well, uh, the expression that comes to mind is familiarity breeds contempt. Much of the damning evidence exposing Boeing's attitude to public safety came from the company's own staff in emails, all written before the first 737 MAX had crashed. One specific message from a Boeing employee to his colleague spelled it out with damning clarity. Would you put your family on a max? I wouldn't, it said. It's unbelievable for families of crash victims, Ike and Susan Riffle, who lost both their sons in the Ethiopian Airlines crash. Ike, I think you've described it as corporate homicide. Is that how you feel? Yeah, it's 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 corporate, you know, it's it, it's corporate homicide. Yeah, and I do feel that way. It's individuals in that company that that causes to happen. But there are individuals who, like Ike said, pushed this along, looked aside at information they received and said, "Let's go forward." 
Coming up... We are going to get to the bottom of this. Where were the watchdogs on Boeing? Uh, we might have a problem, but you find it. How was the Max ever allowed to take off? I think they could have saved those people on that plane's life. The analysis predicted that 15 extra crashes would kill 2,900 people. That's understandable. That's next on Under Investigation. Boeing's own secret emails prove it knew the 737 MAX was a flawed aircraft. One specific message spelled it out with damning clarity. Would you put your family on a MAX? I wouldn't. For Ike and Susan Riffle, who lost their only sons, each new revelation is a hammer blow to their hearts. It's corporate homicide. I wake up every night, in the middle of the night, First thought is the boy. But why was it allowed to go so wrong? Where was the watchdog? The expression that comes to mind is familiarity breeds contempt. Under the glare of the US congressional investigation, Boeing CEO Dennis Muhlenberg finally acknowledged the flawed MCAS flight system that could take control of the 737 MAX. I know this committee has many questions about the MAX and we'll do our best to answer those today. It was perhaps the most dramatic corporate confession in aviation history. We know both accidents involved the repeated activation of a flight control software system called MCAS. Regulators around the world should rigorously scrutinize the MAX and only approve its return when they are completely satisfied with its safety. The public deserves nothing less. We can and must do better. He actually, I felt, deflected everything away from Boeing again. It was a, a PR exercise. And he just reflected it away and said, we might have a problem, but you find it. Peter, I get a sense, tell me if you disagree with this, that Boeing's still not sure it's to blame. Uh, I'm, no, I think Boeing has unhappily accepted the fact that they are culpable in many, many ways and they're prepared to wear it. And the proof is But do the they body. believe it though? Do they believe it? Yes. Yeah, Peter, I, I still feel, when you looked at it, Boeing said, oh, we're going to set up safety oversights. We're going to, that's stuff that should have been in place. Yes. And yeah. this is where the company culture, it's all failed. And the fact they're going to go and do this now is almost, well, damn it, we've been caught. Yes. And so because we've been caught, we'll go and do something. And how long does that, um, is that sustainable? Do they fall back to their old ways? Do we just ignore them again? Yeah, that's what worries me. Now, it's supposed to be the world's leader. It regards itself as the world's leader, and it has failed. In America, it's the job of the Federal Aviation Administration to ensure aircraft are ready to fly. And its judgment is often relied upon by the rest of the world. But in Boeing's case, the rules were different. The company was allowed to use its own employees to represent the FAA. Astonishingly, it meant Boeing was virtually able to certify its own aircraft. This FAA scenario where Boeing pays for people to tell the FAA um, if there's a problem surely is the ultimate conflict of interest. And this is probably one of the most shocking things is there's a huge amount of trust that people have in these regulatory authorities, particularly in places like Australia in the US. You know, when you're booking a, an airline ticket in Australia, you don't even think about safety. You just assume that there's a certain level of safety that has been looked after for you in the background. And so to find out that there's this such a cosy relationship and such a problematic relationship between Boeing and the FAA, I think that would really shake people's confidence in air travel. One of the reasons we in Australia should be concerned about the FAA is because we are relying on an American watchdog yep. to provide aircraft that are safe for Australians to yep. get on board. Not quite, but, not yep. quite, because we send CASA send okay. inspectors over uh, to, to work with the Do FAA. Do they ever knock yes. any back? Uh, I've never known of an aircraft that's been knocked back, now. In perhaps the most shocking revelation of all about the FAA's relationship with Boeing was the FAA's own analysis after the first crash of the 737 MAX, which predicted there would be more. This analysis says that in the lifetime of these aircraft in operation, uh, they predicted there would be uh, a potential of 15 uh, fatal crashes. I'm not aware of any other certified transport aircraft 
that has such an analysis. And I question why uh, the aircraft wasn't grounded once this analysis was done. And as a At U.S. congressional hearings into Boeing, the FAA's chief, Stephen Dixon, offered little explanation when questioned about their crash predictions. You know, with, with all with all due respect, you know, the the any indication that any level of accidents is, is acceptable in any analysis is is not reflective of the 45,000 dedicated professionals at the FAA. So, okay, you're, you're not gonna say anything definitive. I'm not aware of any other aircraft that where this sort of analysis has, you know, found something that's gonna cause crashes inevitably and been allowed to fly. I find that fairly disturbing, actually. Mm. This is where the FAA bosses, the Boeing bosses, have got to step up and say, what's acceptable? Now, you can only strive for zero. You can't say we're going to have zero accidents. That's impossible because the, the human factor. But you've got to say that's unacceptable. In the glare of public condemnation, Boeing went into damage control. But outrage at Boeing's culture of profits before safety boiled over at its CEO, Dennis Muhlenberg. Let me ask you this, Mr. Muhlenberg. You said you're accountable. What does accountability mean? Are you taking a cut and pay? Are you working for free from now on until you can cure this problem? These people's relatives are not coming back. They're gone. It's not about the money for me. That's not why I came Are you college. giving up any money, Congressman? You're not taking a cut and pay at all? Congressman, I am accountable, sir. Under enormous pressure, Dennis Muhlenberg resigned with a final apology to the families of those who had died. I wanted to tell you I'm sorry. And uh, I've had the opportunity to talk with some of you and hear your stories. And uh, we, we are deeply, deeply sorry. I will never forget. Well, for Ike and Susan Riffle, Boeing's contrition rang very hollow. And has Boeing been in contact with you at all? Boeing has had no contact with us whatsoever. No. Nothing? Nothing. Coming up... Boeing is just a company. You can say Boeing did this. I mean, that's not a person that you can look at in the eyes. The disaster aircraft takes to the skies again. You must accept risk. Otherwise, you would just stay on the ground. And it's coming to Australia with the MCAS system still on board. The plane is inherently unstable. It needs software to fly. That's next on Under Investigation. Boeing apologises to the families of all those killed aboard the two 737 Maxes, which spiralled out of control. We are deeply, deeply sorry. We'll never forget. The CEO resigns, but still the company fails to make personal contact with grieving families, including Ike and Susan Riffle, who lost both sons aboard a 737 MAX in the desert of Ethiopia. I'm very angry. I'm very angry at that whole process. I don't think I'll ever be able to forgive what happened. So what does Boeing face for the corporate deception that left 346 people dead? It's individuals. It's, it's individuals in that company that, that causes to happen. The US Justice Department has pressed criminal charges, but Boeing has come to an arrangement to avoid or defer these charges by agreeing to pay a $2.5 billion fine. It sounds a lot until you realise that under the deal, the families of the hundreds of passengers who died in the crashes will get approximately 1.4 million US dollars each, while the airlines who lost profits due to the grounding of the MAX will share $1.77 billion in compensation. So the Justice Department finds the corporation criminally responsible then there are individuals there who are criminally responsible and they should be held accountable for their actions. You're basically saying you're concerned that Boeing's getting away with they it. They are, they are. I mean, that's a slap on the wrist of Boeing. I think there's, there's people in there 
that are criminal responsible for what happened. And I'd like to see him come to the stand, found guilty or not guilty. I don't understand the regulatory... Uh, no individuals will stand trial. And for a company worth $150 billion, the penalty Boeing has negotiated seems paltry. This deal breaking is just allowing them to get off the hook. Yeah, they're, they're, not, away lightly. they're not put in the courts where people can hear. They've got to stand there and speak up. So we're not getting the transparency. All of this, again, is still not transparent. We should say that Ike and Susan Riffle are very angry about the fact that it's reported they're going to get all this money. Yeah. There seemed to be a large element of frustration from the Riffles that they weren't, you know, they weren't going to have their day in court, essentially. There, there was no one was going to take the stand and have to answer for the things that they've done in, in a public sphere. And that's, that's pretty important to people who've, who've been through something like yes, that. Yes, so I think families of victims want to see someone explain why I decided to do this. Yeah. Uh, those individuals, yeah. because we do know because who they as, are. As he said, you know, Boeing is just a company. You can say Boeing did this, but but what is that? That's that's a, that's a thing. That's not a person that you can look at in the in the eyes. No, and, in fact, you can hide behind a, yeah. a company shield. I kind of feel deep down in my heart of hearts. There's a lot of engineers and management in Boeing that say, well, it wasn't really our fault. We'll blame the pilots. Boeing has now redesigned its disaster aircraft. The potentially deadly MCAS system remains in the 737 MAX, but pilots now have the ability to shut it off, and it also now relies on two sensors instead of one, enough to allow it to be recertified to fly. I would have no trouble flying on this aircraft now. There comes a time where you must accept risk, otherwise you would just stay on the ground. But don't we have the, the old problem? What they did to it to get it in the air with these new big fuel efficient engines but still creates I, the same I, I problem. I'll say that probably now the 737 MAX is the safest aeroplane flying because it's been so well tested and certified, more than any other aeroplane in history. I think so I would fly on it. Australians may well be having to decide soon whether they want to fly on the Boeing 737 MAX. Virgin Australia will take delivery of 25 of the 737 MAXs, as will airlines in New Zealand and Fiji. Ike and Susan Riffle, whose sons died in the Ethiopian crash, are calling for the MAX to stay grounded. The 737 MAX was given recertification. It was given the thumbs up to fly again. When you heard that, what was your reaction? I, I, I wasn't really surprised. I, I mean, it, it makes me sick, but I don't think I was really surprised. Well, you and other uh, families of victims have asked for that decision to be rescinded. Have you had any reaction? Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't had, we haven't heard back on anything on that. The plane is inherently unstable. It needs software to fly. Um, they need to start over with, with a new plane. What would you be saying to those who are thinking of stepping back on board? I would advise them not to. I think over time, people are going to forget that, that, this, that there was accidents in this plane until all the facts are out and they quit hiding the facts. I wouldn't recommend anybody get on that airplane. There has never been a story quite like this in aviation history. The flying public has the right to feel somewhat unsettled by what's been revealed. The question is, can our faith be restored to get back on the max? And how should we judge the aviation giant Boeing? What's the report card on Boeing? I think they've got to fail. Peter, did Boeing fail? So I would definitely give them a big if. I think we can argue about the different things that could have happened, what the pilots could have done differently, what Boeing could have done differently. At the end of the day, 346 people have died. Oh, yeah. So there was a serious, serious problem and something went very, very wrong. All right, well, the question left is then, is what happened forgivable? No, I don't think so. I, th I think there's some truly shocking things. You know, I'm, I'm a parent of two young boys and, and to think about what those parents, the, the Riffles have been through and so many other families have been through, it's, it's absolutely unforgivable. Yeah, unforgivable, really. I mean, uh, to let a system operate flight controls that overpowers the pilot, that's just unbelievable. Was it unforgivable? Unforgivable. 
<laughs> yes. That's a yes? Yes, it's a yes. Well, I think it is unforgivable, but there's no future in the past, but there's great lessons. And if we take those lessons, we won't forgive this team that did it, but we expect higher standards of the team that are taking us forward. And that's what we've got to look for. And I think uh, also not to forget what forget Don't what forget. has happened. So in closing, it's appropriate that we hear once more from icon Susan Riffle. How do you express to us what this has been like? It's just a nightmare. It just continues to be a nightmare. I wake up every night, middle of the night, first thought is the boys. Wake up every morning, first thought is the boys. It's just a nightmare all the time. And that's been the same for me. It's, it's, it, it, it's I think about the boys every day, every hour of the day probably, when I wake up, when I go to sleep. And, and, and I think about it that maybe if it was an accident, it would be easier to put up with it. But the fact that it was a, a risk that Boeing took, the, the, the played a game of Russian roulette with the flying public, um, and, and they lost, the boys lost, the public lost, and everyone else on that plane fl lost, and all the families lost. So it is in good faith we step on board an aircraft, believing that the very best has been done to keep us safe. It is a betrayal of trust when we learn that that has not been done. Our hearts are with the Riffle family and with all the families of those lost aboard the 737 MAX crashes. I want to thank you all very much for joining me in this conversation. I'm Liz Hayes. Good night. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching our brand new event series, Under Investigation. Subscribe to our channel now for more great stories from both Under Investigation and 60 Minutes Australia. For other exclusive Under Investigation content, visit ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.